Adventure. Tonight's story by Dorothy Bennett is entitled On the Roof of the World. The Chinese patrolled their borders and the Russians theirs. And the wind patrolled them both, sweeping down from the snows of the Hindu Kush with a fine disregard for political terrain. I wore the felt boots, the flapped leather cap, the skins and the furs that are standard dress in this part of the world. And I wondered what idiot impulse had made me bribe my way into this camel train to follow the old silk road across the roof of the world just so that I could go home and write about it, if I survived. The name, by the way, is Ben Conyon. And in addition to myself, there was another stranger with the caravan. He called himself Paul Duclerc and claimed to be French, but my every instinct told me he was Russian. So what, I said. And as I said, the winds of the Hindu Kush know neither politics nor nationalities. In this part of Afghanistan, there can be energy for only one thing. Survival. Oh, I never saw such whiteness. Not even a rock breaking the snow crust. Isn't this land ever green, Ali? <laughs> In the summer, below the snow line. I'll take your word for it. You wish to experience a camel caravan in winter? Oh. It is beyond your imagining, no? You're right. Oh, I thought I'd experienced cold, but never like this. Here, one needs a skin like leather and a belly like iron. <laughs> and still one suffers. Even the camels, the yaks, and the mountain ponies. Yet you spend the best part of your life here. Why? It is our home, where we were born and, and bred. But these snows... Are that... part of my people. Here we are down to elementals. Yes. And a sky so blue it blinds you, and a wind so cold it freezes you. There's a sort of purity here. It is the snow. People speak of virgin snow, but to experience this is a sort of rebirth. Yes. For a historian, you wax poetical. You are laughing at me. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to sound offensive. You know, crossing these frozen rivers, these silent passes is bad enough, but at least we know each camp is only temporary. That there is a return? Exactly. But to live here... You think it would be terrible? Yes. You agree, Paul? Lonely, but not terrible. The small communities through which we have passed have seemed to me to be happy. Yes, but they miss so much. <laughs> Central eating and civilized diseases, pollution and politics. <laughs> yes, you scored a point. <laughs> Ali, don't you ever wish to know something else? I have visited the West. You have made impressive strides. Ah, uh, you see. Uh, impressive strides into chaos. To say. Here, you're quite literally the men on a high roof. You can afford to be superior. Uh, not superior, my friend. Different. Allah's kindest gift to a man to make him a member of a poor community. On the premise that those who are loved are humble. Rather say that those who are humble are not subject to the jealousy of others. <laughs> Each night, Paul, you make maps. Tracing the age-old routes. As a historian, that's my job. You better make most of your time, then. I don't know about you, but it took me nearly two years to get permission to join this caravan. My small country is surrounded by the great power groups. We have need to be wary. Despite the fact that you are poor? There is always the danger that we might be used as a corridor. Oh, no army would survive this weather. We were spending the night in a village where I would have thought no village could survive. A cluster of half a dozen dwellings clinging to a mountain face, torn at by the eternal wind and half buried in snow. But there were women here, and children, to say nothing of the goats and the yaks. A curious smell overhung the quarters to which Paul and I had been assigned, a smell of dung and yaks' wool and rancid tea. 
We were on the most northerly side of the Barkhan Corridor and moving ever closer to the borders of the Soviet Union where in some remote settlement Ali intended to trade, bartering the goods he brought with him in the camel train for lapis lazuli, the finest of wool cloth and handsome rugs. I will leave you to sleep now. Sleep well, my friends. Tomorrow the passes takes us to nearly 14,000 feet and there will be no rest for man or animal. Hmm. Well, how do you like the sound of that? Oh, sound of what? Ali exaggerates. There was only one pass at that height. You've been through this way before, hmm? I thought I had made that clear when we left Kabul, no? But I have studied maps. On whose behalf? My own. You, uh, seem surprised. Well, I just think you're earning a living the hard way. What about you? Would not your books be just as effective, set on some balmy Pacific Isle? I want something different, even if I have to get frostbite to do it. It seems a long time since we started out with this caravan. It does. Another life. And that was strange enough. Ben, hmm? had you consider waiting here and picking up the caravan on its return journey? Not go on, you mean? The next few days are going to be terrible. Even for men who are used to this. Had you thought of staying here? No. Then why suggest it? The sort of cold you will experience tomorrow, the lack of oxygen, is a torture to which no man should subject himself unless he is desperate. It can't be worse than we've had. It will be infinitely worse. Are you desperate, Paul? I need to complete my maps. And I don't want to buckle in at the knees now. Uh, thanks for the warning anyway. Good night. Bonne nuit, my friend. Is she asleep? Yes. It took a long time. That's why I'm late. Get inside the brazier. Warm yourself. It is no time for a man to be creeping from one shelter to another. I am not cold except with fear. If the fates are willing for the venture to succeed, it will succeed. The fates are not likely to take compassion on a man who has not made proper plans. We have done our part. It is for them to do theirs now, at their end. It is over a year since we were able to communicate. And then only through a third medium. All the better. Where there is no constant intrigue, there is no suspicion. The past worries me. Others have survived it. Until we are back at this point in our return journey... I shall not feel successful. However well it goes at the border. The important thing to hurry without giving the appearance of speed. You are sure your men are to be trusted? How many times have you asked me that, Paul? No one will talk. They don't know yet. Not yet. When will you tell them? After we have climbed the pass, perhaps. Perhaps never. You may need their help. They take their leadership from me. If I twist the truth a little in the name of mercy, they twist it with me. In the name of mercy or expediency? You must not doubt me now, Paul. Uh, how many of us journey onwards? Six. And the four baggage camels. Are you counting the Englishman? I understood that you did not wish him to come. That you were going to dissuade him. He is determined to accompany us. Then let him. It won't matter. We know nothing of him. He would not have been allowed to join my caravan had he not been vouched for. But we know nothing of him as a man, uh, an individual... You are afraid of his politics? I do not know them. After all these weeks? I only know what he says. He could be a first-class actor. Hmm. An actor who watches you. That could be the case, could it not? <laughs> if he had wanted you, Paul, he would have hardly crossed the Hindu Kush to get you when he could have destroyed you in Kapoor. Ali, you mentioned that a poor country is less liable to pressure than a rich one. That applies to men, too. <laughs> You mean that a man with a poor brain is left undisturbed? Is he not? Like a cabbage, until he's cut off. <laughs> but a man without a brain is as barren as a desert. And as uncaring. <laughs> Men have strange fancies at altitude, and we are already high up. It will go well at the border. The day after tomorrow. Yes, the day after tomorrow. And when your camelier see a woman has joined the caravan, what then? It is not always easy to tell the sex when a person is muffled in the furs and felts and the skins of winter. They will have to know. To start with, they will think I have bought myself a wife in the bazaar. I long for the next two days, and I fear them. There will be no time for worrying tomorrow, Paul. 
It will take all your thoughts, all your feelings, all your skill to cross the pass. I knew nothing of this conversation between Paul and Ali. I was dead to the world, as I had been night after night on our grueling journey through Afghanistan. It was my practice to wake an hour or two before dawn and write up my notes by the light of a torch while Paul slept. But on this particular morning, I had no such time. We were awakened while it was still dark. You are still determined to come, Ben? Why should I drop out now? Half the cameleers are staying behind here. And for what reason? The past is not every man's meat. One or two are married to the women of this village. And anyway, they trust Ali to trade for them. And some of them don't think it too healthy to stray quite so close to the Russian border. Huh? I wouldn't know about that. You're Russian, aren't you? With a name like Duclerc. Well, what's in a name? I only know what you seem fit to tell me. Meaning? I don't know your French any more than you know I'm English. On your passport, it states you are English. So you sneaked a look at that, did you? One has to be wary of one's traveling companion. Yes, I'm English, all right. But it didn't occur to me to delve into your passport. You wish to see it? Oh, I'm sure it's in order. These things can be uh, arranged. Just what are you driving at? You evoke a memory, Paul... A face, a name. What name? I can't for the life of me remember. I am who I say I am. All right, fair enough. I don't give a darn about your past or your future. What do you know about my future? Nothing. Haven't I just said... You have accused me of masquerading as a Frenchman. Now you speak about my future as though you had some, some inner knowledge. Look, I assure you I haven't. We've had an easy slog of it through these winter snows. It's of more importance to me that a man should have endurance than nationality. I am Russian by birth and by upbringing until I was 13. Then my mother widowed. She married a Frenchman and was given permission to take me with her to France. She relinquished her Russian citizenship. And you took your adoptive father's name? Precisely. I wondered why he should think it necessary to lie. We were interrupted by a woman bringing us tea... And the water tasted smoked and it was flavored with salt. Not my favorite way to start a journey. And when Paul and I stepped outside, it was to find Ali already mounted, along with five of his cameleers. The stars were still bright in the sky, the ground frozen and glittering. There was no wind. But I knew it was only in hiding somewhere, gathering strength. remained overcast, and this added to our misery. I thought Paul had forgotten our pre dawn conversation and his suspicions of my sincerity. I still groped to find out why his face evoked a memory, and I drew a blank. After time, a man had no room for thought. The elements took possession of us all. Then we came to a bridge slung across a gorge, and I thought we'd come to journey's end. I rested with the others in the lee of an overhang while Paul and Ali went forward to inspect it. The wind gathered strength somewhere in the upper reaches of that gorge and rushed down with the speed of an express train, swaying the bridge, clawing at it. You should wait before crossing. You yourself said we must hurry. And the wind is no respecter of time. Is it impossible to cross now? It's not impossible, but dangerous. We must cross. My men will not expect me to give the word until the wind drops a little. Crossing now may be dangerous, but to delay near the border will be worse. Perhaps. The bridge itself is safe, is it not? It is strong, yes. So the only fear is that the wind may sweep your men from it. Only a fool does not recognize danger. Ali, cross. If we do not appear on time, the whole of this journey may have been for nothing. Oh, very well. Ali. Wait. Yes. He is suspicious. And Conyon? He would have spoken before now. Would he? Would he not think it better to take us both at the border? He has no legal rights here. But if he is what I think... An agent? I think you are wrong. I cannot take that chance. What plans do you dream up now? The bridge is dangerous. 
If you were to be swept off it, it's anyone, anyone. With an accident crossing the gorge, my men will see the caravan is cursed. And that will be an end to it. They will go back. But if we could only take the right steps. Or take one step at a time. No more. It is all a man can do on the high roof. The settlement where Ali had chosen to trade was on the shores of a frozen river. Remnants of a wall encircled it, though it was hard to believe there was anything here worth attacking. There was a hostelry for the caravans that came so far east, and a sense of permanence, despite the remoteness of the place. It was dark when we wound our way through the streets, and braziers glowed red with fire. While across the river, white lights stabbed every now and again at the icy sky. Hey, what are those lights? The lights are in Russia. They man their borders night and day. Well, even here? As you say. Well, I shouldn't have thought there was much here to watch. Some of the precious stones that are traded in this town are mined just across the border. The Russians don't like that. Ah. I suppose there's a severe penalty for smuggling. With the aid of nature, yes. I think you'd better explain that. If the Russians catch just such a smuggler, they release him in winter and beyond the town. But a man would die of exposure. Precisely, Ben Conyon. But surely the Russians have no jurisdiction here? Not legally, no. But their spies are everywhere. And don't the townspeople help men treated that way? Many try, or should say have tried. Now it is better not to know. Helping such men triggered off accidents. Shooting accidents? Yes, for which our neighbors would apologize after the men were dead. Well, what about your government? Here you are a long way from Kabul. You suppose there are any Russians in the place tonight? I hope not. You said that fervently enough. I am not always compatible with Russians. And what about Paul? Paul is different. Only part Russian. And we met many years ago when he visited Kabul. Why on earth do you come so far to trade? Because distances are in my blood. And the stones and furs and woolen cloth here are the finest in Afghanistan. Well, the place seems busy enough. Mm. Two caravans came in ahead of us. And both larger than mine. I thought I saw some Chinese. Well, it is probable. Russia, China, Pakistan... The borders are all around us. It is an international town. With the Soviet floodlighting the border, who's fooling who, Ali? Ali's face darkened. He bade me an abrupt good night, not at all his usual courteous self. I found myself in a corner of the hostelry, amid the snoring cameleers. And though I couldn't see them, for there were no windows in the place, I was conscious of those Russian searchlights eternally stabbing, probing. Once must have been towards dawn, I went outside, unable to stand the fetid atmosphere any longer, and stood for a few seconds in the deserted street, and I wondered why it seemed so impossibly dark. It wasn't until I was back in the caravan's ride that I realized why. The Russian searchlights had ceased their vigil. Wake up, Ben Conyon. Hmm? We move now. <sighs> now... It's not even light. And what about your trading? My trading is finished. And Paul? Paul already awaits with the others. Why the change of plans? It was necessary. Oh, for heaven's sake, we're not even rested. Your camel is laden already. It is time to make the return journey. Well, count me out. You cannot join any other caravan. It is not permitted. Now, look. Must I brute you to action like my other cavaliers? You're getting tough all of a sudden, aren't you, Ali? Come! Ali yanked me unceremoniously to my feet, held out the thick felt boots, which I'd only just discarded, and I thrust my feet into them. I was angry and I was tired. The thought of the return journey was a joyless one. He pulled me outside, and now the street, far from being quiet, was full of shouting, and I could hear Paul's voice. You are wrong, I tell you, wrong. I came with the caravan from Kabul. And the woman? What is this about a woman? If I come here to seek a wife, whose business is it but mine? We have reason to the think people that... people in this town have neither thought nor reason. If my wives at home cannot give me sons, why should I not seek one who can? You move out early. To reach the pass before dark. A woman cannot travel fast. Move! Move! Wait! You want a man. Take this man. 
Only for Pete's sake. He's picked up my caravan less than five miles north, and he carries the jewels from across the border. You lying son of Genghis Khan! Search him. He lies in English and has the mind of a serpent, and he mines in Russian territory. I can disprove that. Search him. Ali. He's no business of ours, and my wife grows cold with waiting. If you had not been so insistent on buying a wife here, we might not be in this trouble now. The fairest women in Afghanistan come from this corner of the earth, and she was promised to me when she was a child. I could hear their voices under the cold stars like voices in a dream. The reality was three men bearing down on me, tearing at my clothing, ripping my pockets, and finding a great handful of uncut gems that must have been worth a king's ransom, and not one of which I'd seen before. And I remembered how Ali had yanked me to my feet, crowded me. He must have planted them on me then. The camel train moved off, and I was left with the Russian agents, half naked, or so it felt, and chattering with the cold. It's days since the last camel caravan left the town, and no more are expected for another year. Soon it'll be my turn to be thrown beyond the walls. That I shall be alone and on foot. And no one makes a move to help. And why should they? It's better not to know about men like me. <laughs> Paul was right. I should have kept to some balmy Pacific Isle. Paul... Oh, I think I know now who he was. Do you feel now that we have been successful? Now I know that we have been. Yes. You have your daughter out of Russia at last. But it was a new thing. I did not think there would be so many agents in the town. Oh, it is often so when the caravans go in. It took years of planning, years. And now you will seek security in the West. Untroubled by conscience. Should I be troubled by conscience? What a pain. You planted this stuff on him, not I. You made him the sacrificial lamb. I had no choice. But now... Now? You can journey back to Kabul and beyond. I go back to the pass and beyond. <laughs> you must be mad. A man like you has his own loyalties. A man such as I has his. You have a great brain to bequeath to the Western world. But Allah will smile on he who saves life. Then we'll have perished long ago. Perhaps not. He had endurance, that one. You, you took your time, I. I knew they would not fling you out until the last of the cameliers had gone. Uh, well, if you think... I have the strength to ride across the roof of the world. You have the strength, then, Conyon. <laughs> I'd like to see spring in the Hindu Kush. <laughs> you probably will. <laughs> you fixed me, brother, Ali. Signed my death warrant. Why? For the sake of Paul and his daughter. Russians, both. You were right about that. I remember his work on disease that could revolutionize the medical world. He tried to impart his knowledge to the West. He escaped, and they held his daughter hostage. And he said he couldn't speak until she was free. <laughs> I thought you weren't compatible with Russians. I am not compatible with Russians, only with men. <laughs> Let's go. I was a wreck when Ali picked me up. And if all that was high adventure, I thought it was for the birds. I often wondered why he'd come back for me, tough leader of men that he was. 
But it was weeks before I asked him. And by then, the high passes were behind us. What on earth made you come back for me, Arnie? Merely to avenge the insult you hurled at me? Insult? You called me a lying son of Genghis Khan. Oh. It angered me. <laughs> I wanted you to eat those words, to become beholden to me. As you are. <laughs> <laughs> High Adventure is produced by Anne Freed and directed by Henry Diffenthal.